Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here with you. I think uh, this is going to be a fast-paced presentation uh, on the Zika virus in the post-epidemic phase, an evolving narrative. Uh, next slide, Ruth, please. Uh, yeah, so this is this is quickly my background. I come from Brazil, um, uh, trained in infectious diseases there, and um, got involved with a lot of research in genomics. And now uh, I do a PhD on using genomics for diagnosis of infectious diseases. This is something that I will um, uh, talk about very, very quickly here. Next, please, uh, Ruth. Yeah, so the objectives, uh, I think it's going to be really an overview to the detriment of come getting into too much of the detail on the pathology itself. But I think... Um, it will be interesting to see how how this particularly epidemic evolved. And I think in your mind, I would ask you, and I think this is going to be intuitive, and you'll be doing this anyway, to, to kind of establish parallels with all the situations of epidemics or pandemics that we've been living, okay? So, of course, there will be the parallel with COVID-19 pandemic, and you can also think about the, the outbreaks of monkeypox infection. So, I think this will be cool so that we, yeah, overview and where we are now. So I will hopefully provided you with insights and then if depending on your interest, you can delve into that later. So surveillance systems and notification strategies, epidemics, communication strategy, and pathogenomics as well. And then again, as I said, the parallel between uh, the different epidemics. Next, Ruth, please. So I will start with this interesting post from ProMed. I don't know if you're all familiar with ProMed. I, I highly um, uh, recommend you look at that. It's the largest publicly, uh, publicly available surveillance system that kind of does some global reporting of infectious diseases outbreak throughout the world. You just can subscribe and then you, you, you receive a feed of emails. Um, and so I remember seeing this post uh, in May uh, 2015, when the Minister of Health reported a case cases of a rash illness in the northeast region of Brazil. So you see Brazil is divided into states, and then the northeast region, there are many states there. And in that particular region, there, there, is, there was this rash disease. Uh, uh, and after three months, the total number of notifications reached 7,000, okay? So very, very fast um, spreading. So the majority of cases had a really, really benign cause. The most common sign and, and symptoms, there were an itchy rash and less frequently low-grade fever, headache, pain, and, and swelling joints or muscle pain. Uh, and the most affected age group was a young population, okay, between 20 and 40 years of age. So what is the differential here? We know that uh, Brazil, uh, since 2009, uh, faces a, a quasi-permanent uh, epidemic state for dengue. So loads of cases, okay? So between, in, in that year, between January and September, we had over 1,500,000 cases of dengue notified. So what do you think with that description? Well, is it dengue? Uh, next, Ruth, please. Yeah, so, but fine, fair enough. Uh, really difficult to test the majority of the, 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 the proportion of, of those cases. So you're not, you really don't have an etiology at that time. But then a few a month later, a few months later, there's an unusual increase in babies born with microcephaly in Pernambuco. PE is Pernambuco is one of the states in the northeast um, region of Brazil. This was uh, uh, flagged to the State Secretary of Health by one doctor that is specialized in doing um, um, a prenatal ultrasounds. So that's very interesting, right? It says, wow. I mean, this week I saw two or three cases, which is absolutely unusual, okay? So the State Secretary of Health issued a clinical protocol, okay? So let's start recording this. Immediately 90 cases of um, um, microcephaly cases were registered when the annual mean is nine. OK, so what is the differential here? So I think it's important to say that microcephaly, there is a difficulty in diagnosing it. And it's not only in Brazil or in, in lower middle income countries. No, this is worldwide because we don't. First of all, we don't have a baseline prevalence of central nervous system anomalies. OK, in, in children, microcephaly is very complicated because it's it's there is no standardization on how to measure. It's not as straightforward to measure as you would think. And there are so many different levels of ascertainment that vary in Europe and the United States that most countries actually microcephaly, it's not a mandatory notification. 
Okay, so after this pandemic, of course, it became so clear that you need to standardize things. So there was a study uh, conducted worldwide to be able to 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 try and get to what is the normal head circumference, right? It's such a such a primal uh, uh, question. But yeah, there you go. Uh, next, Ruth, please. So, yeah, so in November, so many months later, um, uh, what are we doing about that from a from a, a you know like communication point of view or how the country is um, um, managing this or because it's it's I remember feeling I was living here at the time already but I remember feeling it's very terrifying isn't it you have an epidemic of 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 children being born with this really really severe uh, uh, a problem so and we don't know what is causing it okay so politicians of course coming to play and then I think invite you to kind of make the parallel with with the COVID-19 pandemic whatever you lived the the first year of the pandemic or so so politicians can they solve diagnostic conundrums uh, well not really right so what do you need when the situation is 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 it, it seems that it's so um it's so scary for the general public of course for for the medical community it is as well you need to establish the right studies to understand what that is so epidemiological studies such as case control um you get the people that are affected and match with controls and try to identify the risk factors that are most likely uh, contributing to that uh and then you follow up cohorts uh but then you usually you know like politicians the burden of a certain thing it's it's too heavy and it was particularly heavy in brazil at the time uh, economic crisis and um other problems so um you, there was a selection of one piece of evidence to fit with the assumptions okay because i need to tell the people what this is so at the moment there had been one case of a positive zika test in a child um uh, with who had microcephaly okay so yeah the, the Minister of Health jumps in. Next, please, Ruth. And uh, what do they do? They do a declaration of a public health emergency of national concern. OK, this was in line with international sanitary regulations set up by the WHO. But of course, there was a lot of uh, um, people were bewildered. How can you say that when, you know, there is there is only one case and the with where you could you could prove the kind of microbiological test? Uh, in retrospect, this was absolutely correct. But at the time, I remember thinking that was a bit of a very, um, and I don't know, it wasn't it wasn't right from the from the government to have done that. So when you set up this public health emergency of national concern, you make the mandatory notifications of cases of microcephaly. You you put up guidance and protocols. You direct more money towards that, and then there is a plan to to national plan to fight microcephaly. Uh, and then you you kind of link different agencies and different ministries to to coordinate the response. Next, Ruth, please. And then it's very interesting, right, to see the this ever evolving adjustments and 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 the risk perception from the point from from the part of researchers and and the and the public health agencies and the the public and the language, right, that is used. So um, so that was after three months from the Brazilian National Emergency Declaration, then the WHO declares the public health emergency of international concern. OK, and what what um, gives ground to this decision is, is they, they say that the language is the link, while strongly suspected between the virus, Zika virus and cases of microcephaly has not yet been proven. OK, so but I mean, you need you need to to Again, COVID-19 pandemic, one of the WHO officers said, you need to get there fast and hard because when a situation like this comes up, there is no empty spaces, all right? So somebody would, would uh, dominate the narrative and it could be, you could be really fine-tuned risk communication, I think there is a science behind it, you know, of course there is, and what do you do and how do you convey this thing that we don't know and knowledge is being built as we speak, right? So so this is, I think, in Brazil, in the case, they got there fast and it was a good thing in the end. So, but the WHO, yeah, in, uh, recommended increased research. And then what does this public health emergency of international concern? Again, it really um, tell the country, tells the country you need you need to get your act together and you need to then put 
resources uh, in place to deal with this. OK, so it's kind of it's mostly to, to bring awareness and uh, to force countries to, of course, it can't, it's not um, uh, binding. So, of course, countries will choose how to deal with it. But yeah, there is a strong recommendation that something should be done. Next, Ruth, please. And the evidence builds up. OK, so most of the data in the beginning is still deriving from studies of very weak design, as you would expect. It's 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 normal. The consistency of data is not ideal and the consistency of measuring measurements of, of head, to say the least, right, of head per, um, um, circumferences. And then you have this guilty until proven innocent versus, oh, OK, it's circumstantial evidence only. OK, so what happens at this stage? Uh, countries, so they had never been, I will talk about this, but no cases in the Americas ever of Zika virus infection, but there had been outbreaks before. So in these countries where there had been outbreaks, people start looking into the data they had. And so there is this, this first paper here, there was an outbreak in French Polynesia. Okay, so there was an outbreak of, of, of Zika virus and loads of cases, an increase in case of Guillain-Barre syndrome diagnosed. So let's go and understand if there were relationship then without records and then at the same time there is um, a cohort of pregnant women in rio and uh, the genera in brazil that it started being followed to see the outcomes of pregnancy so this is this is really interesting uh, next ruth please so quick overview of microcephaly okay so what can cause microcephaly infections toxins or it could be of genetic cause okay so by May 2016, so a year after the first case was flagged up by the by the ultrasonographer in, in Pernambuco who was scanning too many babies or fetuses with small heads. Uh, so a year later, nearly 7,000 uh, reported cases of microcephaly or the congenital uh, abnormalities of uh, the central nervous system or both had been reported in Brazil. OK. Uh, but then you need to confirm because, of course, you define confirmed case, um, suspected cases and confirmed cases. So 7,000 suspected, but then you need to go and confirm with with a physical examination and with the blood test. So it takes time. Um, the state of Pernambuco, that region in Brazil, the leader of notified cases, uh, I think nearly 2,000 cases have been reported since the first epidemiological bulletin, OK, um, uh, issued a year late uh, earlier. Next, Ruth, please. Uh, yeah, and so so Guillain-Barre syndrome, um, um, if you don't remember, the autoimmune neurological uh, illness that causes muscle um, weakness. So it's, uh, yeah, immune system damaging the peripheral nervous system. OK, and then a few countries started reporting that, OK, uh, cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome associated with Zika virus infection. Uh, next, Ruth, please. Uh, and then other, at the same time, uh, um, uh, countries started notifying other severe presentations of CNS involvement and known CNS involvement and Zika infection. So with patients in whom we, we diagnosed Zika infection, either indirectly with serology or with a PCR to detect the, the, the RNA of the virus. So cases of meningoencephalitis, acute myelitis, and then lots of eye abnormalities and eye issues such as uveitis. Uh, but up to then, Thankfully, a very small number of fatal cases reported. Next, please. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, at that point, a new entity is described, which is the congenital Zika syndrome. OK, so these babies, they would, the, 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 in terms of neurological findings, lots, lots of, 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 of signs and, and, and symptoms. So hypertonia, hyperreflexia extreme irritability, tremors, seizures, brainstem dysfunction and dysphagia. So, of course, it's a spectrum of how much the central nervous system is affected and you can have really, really tragic um, manifestations. You also have loads of eye abnormalities. So, macrophthalmia, lens subluxation, cataracts, intraocular calcifications, different abnormalities of the optic nerve. Um, yeah, so the, um, there were so many cases described that then this syndrome was um, um, defined. Next one, please, Ruth. So what, what types of evidence have we got so far? So we've got the epidemiological evidence, right? So you see countries reporting suspected cases that fit established definition. So you see how many countries reporting um, uh, over a year later 
nearly 30 countries. Next, please. Another type of, you know, more epidemiological evidence. So uh, Salvador is a city in Bahia, another state of the northeast region of Brazil, that it was beautiful. Look at these epidemic epidemiologic uh, curves here. So the number of suspected cases of microcephaly peaked uh, after uh, a lag of 30 to 33 weeks from an acute rash illness peak at the time. And then it corresponds to time of potential infection of pregnant mothers during the first trimester of pregnancy. OK, so this is observational evidence, epidemiological evidence. Next, Ruth, please. Uh, what else? So you have this cohort and you have the preliminary reports of studies being conducted. So you have this follow up of a cohort of the 88 pregnant women in Rio with rash realness and then and then more data, of course, emerging from other countries. Colombia also had a, a, an important um, um, outbreak there. So with, with this really uh, uh, large um, uh, groups of pregnant women being followed up and then um, that was uh, at the time here as well, uh, the preliminary report from a case, con case control study in Brazil with um, needing more numbers, of course, but already indicating that the association was very plausible. Next, Ruth, please. So epidemiological evidence, what about the clinical um, evidence gathering, right? So you've, you start having case reports of fetal infection where you have you have the clinical manifestations and you can prove microbiologically that the 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 Zika virus was there. OK, so yes, so the association uh, gets increasingly stronger. So you have the Zika RNA, um, virus RNA detecting the amniotic fluid of two children with microcephaly. And then you see serological evidence of past Zika infection. So you found you find in, uh, antibodies identified in Hawaii in a baby with a congenital, congenital microcephaly born to a mother who had been in Brazil during pregnancy. Uh, next, Ruth, please. Uh, and then if you do this, if you follow up these pregnant women, and you can do beautiful studies where you observe You've got, you have data on in terms of blood tests to detect uh, the um, the presence of of immunological markers or to diagnose infection itself. You can follow up. You can know exactly what types of of what was the clinical manifestation in the mother, and you can also serially follow up with ultrasounds how the fetus is developing. So this is this is very interesting. Next, please. And then, yeah, and, and now in terms of this microbiological evidence, what do you do? You start going to, to murine, murine models, right? So you, you, you inoculate the virus and you see what happens, all right? And then you can get tissues, different tissues and specimens and see um, if, if cells get infected. So um, using a Polynesian strain of the virus, you can, it was proven that you can infect placental cells. Um, and then you can see that um, that was damage to the brain of 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 the 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 mouse, the fetal mouse brain. Next, Ruth. Uh, yeah. So I will, I will go mindful of time. I'll just I will not get into details. But then there is similar studies doing with um, with um, strains found in Cambodia as well. So you can you, you see. So now you have to prove that. In the presence of Zika, there is there is um, cells are infected, and then there will be the consequence of that in different tissues. And then you you start establishing what is the mechanism whereby the the virus will cause the problems. So next, please, Ruth. Similar study with Brazilian um, strains, so you can see how um, infection uh, really has an impact in the development of of fetuses. Next, please. And then finally, you found you find evidence in human tissue, right? So this was a study in Puerto Rico that um, you can see, yes, indeed, in fact, placental cells of humans, as it did, in fact, on the on the murine models. So yeah, this is the levels of strength, and I think here it, it gets pretty clear that yeah, there is association, which is most likely causation. Next, Ruth. So so yeah, so that that it kind of the biological aspects of it in a nutshell. What about the dynamics of transmission then, right? So where, where was Zika before this massive outbreak in the Americas? So the virus itself was first identified and described in 1948, 
okay, in the Zika forest in Uganda. The first illness was described in Uganda uh, decades later. Um, serological studies had indicated some widespread human infection in, in some countries in Africa, in India, in Southeast Asia, and in Philippines. But up to 2007, uh, there had been only 13 naturally occurring cases reported. Okay. Next, Ruth, please. So 2007, and why is that? Because in 2007, in, in the Yap Island in the Macronesian archipelago, uh, that was when uh, uh, infection in humans outside Africa and Asia were um, detected. And this island had a population of 6,700 people. Um, the estimate is that almost the entire island got infected. Okay, of course, here is, is, is suspected cases. Not all of them will have been um, will have microbiological confirmation, but um, this is this is extraordinary, right? It's 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 beautiful to see, not not beautiful at the time for the island, but from an epidemiological perspective, you see an island and with a naive immunological naive population, how the virus can wipe um, a, a all the population, which is really interesting. Next, Ruth, please. So there was that outbreak in 2013, 2014. There was an outbreak across all the Pacific Islands. OK, so at this year, there were over 30,000 suspected cases. Next, please. Uh, yeah, so you see, it seems like the, the, the virus is slowly moving. Um, making its way towards, you know, increased increased expansion and tenny, it, it, until it meets um, a, um, the America, South America initially. So what could have brought this virus in? OK, so think about COVID-19. It's the interconnected world. It, it's most likely was brought from um, from travelers. So let's think about particular events that could have happened in Brazil at the time that would have brought uh, uh, would have would have introduced uh, the virus there. So there was a World Cup in Brazil in 2014, but um, no Zika endemic Pacific countries were competing, and therefore, you know, the, the numbers of, of of people coming from these countries would be very very low. However, on the same year, uh, it was in uh, August, so I think it was a month after the World Cup, there was this uh, canoe, canoeing race competition, and it was a world, so VAR World Sprint Championship. And of course, all these countries where we, we, we talked about Zika being there, they're really strong in canoeing. It's kind of a, a common practice and sport. So yeah, so it, it looks like it could have been introduced on that at that time. Next, Ruth, please. And then this is the this is the the, the beauty of, of genomics. Somehow you can go back to these places because people will have will have um, either samples uh, stores or of course you, you keep your your specimens there that you can go back and test in the lab. And then when you get more cases, you try to compare them right uh, with the um, um, genomically so you, you you can do the whole genome sequencing and you can see how all these different strains will relate to one another you would have a timeline and you'll be able to tell um, um, established mutation rates and molecular clock and you can you the timings are clear okay so uh, yeah it showed that uh, all these strains that had been uh, the, the the types that were more common in Africa and then the ones that from Brazil, they share a common ancestor with the strain that circulated in French Polynesia in November 2013. Okay, so that, that is, it was interesting to see. Next, Ruth, please. So why the explosive spread? Okay, so, okay, fine. It was introduced in Brazil, but why was it so successful in establishing the outbreak? And why is that? because it was an immunologically naive population, first of all, but Brazil has is infested basically everywhere. There are loads of very and highly competent, um, highly competent vector, which is the Aedes aegypti, okay? Genomic studies show that there was no, no uh, viral mutation that made the virus much more infectious, okay? No, it was just that beautiful, perfect situation for the virus. Competent vector everywhere in the country and in a naive population. Next, Ruth. Yeah, so beautiful, isn't it? So classic epidemiology. So you, you have the international concern, the public health emergence of that uh, international concern uh, um, that was declared. Not a lot of knowledge at the time, but public health responses could not wait. OK, so it's one of, I think, again, learned with COVID-19, you need to act 
fast, all right? And then with a growing body of evidence, epidemiological and microbiological and the models, the strong suspicion has become a strong scientific consensus, which was really interesting. Next slide, Ruth, please. And I think now I have to go really fast. So this is just the, 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 the final report, the preliminary report, sorry, of the, the case control study that was being conducted in Rio, okay, following up the, you have, you get the babies affected with Zika, and then you get babies that weren't affected, but were born at the same time and had very similar characteristics to the one affected. And then you, you can establish um, um, different risk factors and odds ratio. Next, please. This is a this is a map from this year. What are the countries and territories with current or previous Zika virus infection? OK, so we have 89 countries reporting transmission from 2015 onwards and it continues up to now. All right. So I think over a million people um, are thought to have been infected and uh, approximately uh, 5000 cases confirmed congenital syndrome uh, 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 case associated with Zika. Next, please. Um, not going to delve into that. It's just the specificity of Brazil. In terms of other countries with large epidemics, Brazil was by far the one with the highest uh, incidence of congenital Zika syndrome. Okay, next, please. Um, yeah, so why was that? You know, um, was it, we didn't really get the numbers right. So is it because we had a much, much higher baseline of infections overall, and then this proportion of microcephaly would be in keeping with what other countries saw? Or there are other co-factors, co-infection with dengue or chikungunya that we have a lot as well. Um, anything else? Next, please. There were a few hypotheses, but, um, um, but we don't know that yet. It's not yet clear why the cases in Brazil were so dramatic. Next one, Ruth, please. So what do we need? We need more numbers. We need to continue monitoring. You need to continue to establish other risk factors that could have been uh, accountable for that. Uh, next, Ruth. This is the, then beautifully two years later, the final report of the case control study, okay, uh, was published. And then this one, it was it was really nice. So the association, the, the first line interpretation, the association between microcephaly and congenital Zika virus infection was confirmed, okay, with kind of massive odds ratio. And in this study, they were able to, to see whether there had been, there could have been a relationship with vaccination during pregnancy, okay or with the use of a specific pesticide in, in the region there, but they didn't really find strong evidence that there could be association with that. So this was kind of, yeah, it is. From an epidemiological point of view, it is the virus. Uh, next, Ruth. So 2016, end of the global emergency, okay. The problems were still there, but at, at the time, so what's the difference from the beginning? Now we know, we know more, we know where it comes from, when we know there is a still lots of unknown, in unknowns, but from a point of view of, you know, the, the logistics of WHO, um, yeah, we, we can stop that, okay, and I think that's the right thing to do, and of course, it might make it difficult for situations to keep up to, to countries to keep up the momentum in terms of infrastructure, but yeah, that's, that's what happened. So in November 2016, the end of the pandemic, uh, sorry, pandemic, no, the public <laughs> health emergency of international concern. And finally, very briefly, some next slide, please, please, Ruth. Some pertinent perspectives that go a bit beyond, you know, so now let's think about all these affected um, uh, children. OK, so first of all, human rights. So what happens here? We have a new generation of children born with the serious birth defects and disabilities that will last a lifetime. Uh, putting this strain on families that the, the, the northeast of Brazil is, is very deprived. We need to cater for the needs, the needs, okay, it's an obligation of the state and, and proper support must be put in place. And of course, this has not happened. Next, Ruth, please. Another really, this is a really, really sad thing. So this is a recent study and the it showed, um, it looked in Brazil, uh, it's a cohort study that included all suspected cases of uh, congenital Zika syndrome born in Brazil over three years, okay, and then what it showed, it confirmed that cases had an almost two times higher mortality when compared with unconfirmed cases uh, uh, at 36 months of age, right? Next, Ruth, please, which is very sad. So this is this couple of Meyer curve showing survival Okay, so you see the confirmed cases, the orange bit, 
the the suspected cases, the blue, you see, it's kind of worse than the yellow, but because there's much more uh, children in there, and it's the children on this case that wasn't confirmed. However, very high proportion of children with microcephaly there. So you see what we are doing, right? I mean, it's it's very sad. Next, Ruth, please. And it's the penultimate slide. Climate change as well. So, you know, diseases take flight with climate change. Be why? Because it's providing opportunities for insects to spread infections to new populations. So we know that the Aegis albopictus, uh, it, um, which is the green, you see the map in the United States. Look, it goes up everywhere, everywhere, you know, up to north. Or and, and look at Europe when you when you have the double pixels as well, and it's coming north and north. So regions where you wouldn't really see this before, you will you probably start having autochthonous transmission and establish community transmission of such viruses. And finally, the health economics aspects, right? So of course, these new cases. There was a pandemic, and these cases, you know, support for the families and the children. It's kind of forgotten. And yeah, it shouldn't really happen. And finally, to my last last slide, uh, I think you went back, Ruth. And next, yeah. And so, I mean, there's so many competing interests and so many competing epidemics, and we kind of we need to we need to keep this this these people at heart and at the target of policy, right? So, particularly the mothers. And here I, I put this mother with this child, because in Brazil specifically, there was some very kind of sad um, common occurrence. The partners of these women they would just abandon them, uh, the, the the woman and and their families, because there's a lot of I think anything that happens during pregnancy, there is a lot of of, of burden and guilt attributed uh, over the mother. So very difficult. And I think this 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 is a nice um, image to finish this and and to to kind of highlight who who is at the heart of of everything we do. Um, yeah, thank you. I think it was a rush, but as I said, it was to provide some insights and try to give you a kind of a a, a nice overview of of this of the Zika uh, epidemic. <laughs>